Awesome. All right, I'm gonna jump into this book. <clears throat> the first boy to introduce himself was a nine-year-old named Abdullah. He struck me with his light eyes, gap tooth smile, and spattering of freckles across his nose. There was a gentleness to it to his demeanor. I wondered how such gentleness could come from a child that had been ripped from his home by war. Abdullah told us that he was a Muslim from Sinjar, or Sinjal, as they say in Kurdish. He had been forced to flee two months earlier when ISIS invaded his village. He insisted on showing us around the camp, annotating like a proud tour guide. He explained the different people who lived there and where they were all from. He explained how they had been confronted with the same vicious enemy and how they coped in different ways. Some ISIS we knew, Abdullah said. Some of our neighbors became ISIS too. I did not know then that such a phrase would be repeated time and time again as the years went on. I did not realize then the importance of that phrase, the clefts and all the conspiracies that would come from it. That one phrase would come to represent the fissures of a country that I wasn't sure could ever be put back together. Our neighbors became ISIS too. And you know, there's something that I failed to do as I put these notes together is is you, throughout the book, you you pick these characters and you revisit them. And I get some of them, but I don't get all of them. I'm not sure if I get back to Abdullah, but that's what you do. So as people hear me sort of talk about these different characters, just look, the book is 450 pages long. And so if people are wondering like, oh, I wonder what happened to that kid or what happened to that character, many of the characters that you become close with, you revisit over the years. and and as I said, the length of the book is five years or four, four and a half years, something like that. There's a lot. I mean, think of a, a kid that's, you know, 10 years old becomes 14. That's a big difference. And, and obviously there also are characters that you never see again and God knows what happens to them. Um, fast forward a little bit here. The soldiers at the Mazul Dam greeted us warmly. The Peshmerga began, and you, this I'm giving everyone a background in Peshmerga, which you do. And, and look, you give all kinds of nice little history lessons in here too. The Peshmerga began as something of a mountain militia in the 1920s when the push for Kurdish independence began. In recent decades, they had faced unrelenting persecution from the Ba'ath loyalist and f- of former Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein. One Peshmerga fighter told me they don't suffer from psychological issues pertaining to combat because they have grown up around fighting and have developed an early understanding that it is just what we have to do. To them, PTSD was something of a first world phenomenon. We worked with um, Kurdish soldiers sometimes in the Iraqi army and they were just really good. And and they just were really good. They have that, that's why that, that, that's what they do. They grow up fighting, that's sort of their thing. It's like when you're in the US military and you meet someone that's from, you know, Wyoming, and they grew up hunting and living out in the land, and they're gonna be good soldiers, that's just how it is. Somebody from Alabama that grew up in the woods, they're gonna be a good soldier. That's just how it is. That's that's how you feel about the Kurds. That's how I always felt about the Kurds. And just because they say they don't suffer from any psychological problems doesn't mean that they don't. And that's <laughs> it's just a very different relationship that they have with it. In, in not just the Peshmerga, but in a lot of the you know in the Middle East in those in the armies and things, it's just not something that they they acknowledge or really talk about. Yeah, and and in many ways, it's something that we haven't talked about up until these re- most recent wars. Even though it's always been there. You continue on here. The Peshmerga soldiers range from around 18 to more than 70 years old, with many coming out of retirement in the quest to defeat ISIS threat. During days of intense conflict, the Peshmerga are lucky to return to their base for two or three hours of sleep and a quick bite to eat before venturing back to their fighting locus. As it stood, a prominent portion of the fighters are not soldiers, but what they call security advisors who don't take a salary and volunteered simply out of devotion. There are special forces that have been arranged for these people. They don't register their names and don't sign contracts. They just want to serve in Kurdistan. One Peshmerga soldier 
explained how ISIS commanders often drug young fighters with special tablets that leave them disoriented and shooting wildly into the night. Sometimes they were able to keep going despite being shot several times, taking upwards of 20 bullets before they went down. For those who survive, and that's in reference to the ISIS fighters, when they realize what they've done, they sometimes regret it. And you say here, almost every Kurd wants to share their history, history of their people and their oppression. But the string that could be weaved through and through was that they did not expect to be granted freedom for nothing. They knew they would have to fight for, every, fight for it every step of the way. The secession of letdowns, of losses and gains was all part of their rough climb up the rope of revolution. At the top, they would find their independence. When they referred to their soldiers killed on the battlefield, they sometimes said that they were martyred and sometimes said that they were murdered. I wondered how differently Americans would see wars if the press and the people spoke of our troops in the firing line as having died in a homicide rather than killed in action. And, and now you kind of reflect on this battle that had taken place. The rain fell harder. The bullets flew wildly into the growing darkness that hid the dead ISIS bodies nearby. Hungry, untamed dogs had gouged into the skeletons almost immediately. Some had been dead for days. Some had names and others had been left nameless. Some, maculated by the creatures howling at the moon, had no faces. So you jump right into this stuff with, I mean, this battle that's taking place up at the Mosul Dam. You're seeing the ISIS fighters. This is a, a, a long way from... Um, Paris Hilton's Malibu beach parties, I guess. Definitely. And and when I first went, you know, I didn't go with the intention of of going to the front lines. I, I really went with the intention of trying to understand, I guess, the human cost of war. And I really just wanted to go and talk to people that live there. I wanted to understand what it was like to, to be a, a displaced person, what it was like to, to sort of have everything and, and then have nothing. And... I just happened to sort of make a, a good connection through through somebody, and then when I went to meet him, it was a crazy story. He he came, he picked us up. The car got stuck in the mud, and there was sort of a lot of fighting going on, and so we sort of had to go, to go in a different direction, and then we ended up sort of on the front line. So it wasn't something I'd even really planned, and I'm sure my bosses would have had a heart attack if I'd sort of told them in advance, but. Yeah, it was it was a it was a night very eye opening, and even when I I guess the times that I've spent with the Peshmerga or with other soldiers, Iraqi soldiers on the front line, it's always still been that same theme for me of wanting to get that human cost. So I'm much more interested in in those stories, I guess, from my perspective, than than what we call the the bang bang is what journalists usually call the the sort of the more military aspect of it. I wanted to understand who who they were, who their families were, what their motivation for being there was. As you said, it's you know these people are coming out and and volunteering and and they're not getting paid and they're bringing their AK forty seven from home and they don't really have much more beyond that. And I just that to me was fascinating. What is it? What is motivating you? What is driving you? What what are you sacrificing to do this? And do you plan to just keep doing this over and over again? And I think for me that was always the question that I was trying to trying to understand or trying to piece together in my head. Yeah, and as I'm sitting here thinking about you on the front lines for the first time, sort of and then going back to the the conversation we had about being naive and I just I just remembered a conversation. first of all I've had this conversation with a bunch of veterans, but the one that came to my mind was a, a guy by the name of Dean Ladd, who is a Marine in World War II, who went on the island campaign. And he was going into Tarawa as a Marine, as a Marine platoon commander or company commander, I forget which. But I, there was, this was an insane operation. They could tell it was gonna be insane. You know, they're going to storm the beaches where the Japanese had been dug in for three years. And he did this over and over again. But I, I, you know, I said, well, did you think anything might happen to you? He said, no, it's always gonna happen to the other guy. 
mm-hmm. which is what everybody thinks, mm-hmm. which is what everybody thinks. And you know, that's what I, that's what I think, you know, yeah. that's, that's probably gonna happen to somebody else, but not me. Yeah, and I think just, I guess by nature, you know, with a lot of journalists, whether they've had, you know, tremendous years behind them doing this or not, it's, I guess it's that same notion of, you know, we're not working for the government. We're not working for anyone in particular, you know, beyond our organizations. And so you sort of have this kind of strange freedom. No one is telling you what to do, you know, and and, and for me, I guess I, I really wanted to take advantage of that and, and just, yeah, be, I remember one time being at, um, did you ever go to Taji Air Base? Just outside of Baghdad. I, I think I flew through there, but I never spent any time and there. And I spent a bit of time there, and I was with the Aussies, and then I we were supposed to go to El Assad and on the uh, to the Marine base there, and there was just dust storm after dust storm. So every flight was getting canceled. And I was like, I just want to go back to Baghdad. I was trying to get a, a interview with Sadr, and I was just let's just go to Baghdad, and I couldn't couldn't get back to Baghdad and so I was literally just calling a cab from Taji to like come and get me so I could drive back to my hotel and meet my fixer in Baghdad I remember the Aussies are standing there going you're just crazy and then people were really jealous (laughs) I was like yeah I can I can do that yeah and what's interesting going back to the earlier conversation if you were to take a convoy Mm -hmm. back from there to Baghdad, you would probably be at targeted. greater risk, yep. much greater risk than if you were in a cab, an orange and white opal freaking taxi cab that are driving all over the place. Yeah, yeah. And I, I would do that through work. I, I remember going through like all these Iranian militia checkpoints and I was would be in these Yazidi cars with a baby on my lap pretending I was a Yazidi. You know, I put the scarf over my head. There's a baby in my lap. I think I managed to get through about a hundred of these Iranian <laughs> Shia checkpoints and not one of them questioned me. And I remember just getting out of that being like, oh, had I, mm-hmm. and I know of other journalists, I, I knew a, a couple of people and they, they got busted at checkpoints and turned around or turned in or whatever it was. And, and for me, that was going under the radar. I got to where I needed to be. Had I even got the, the checkpoint permission slips that you're supposed to get, I, would, I wouldn't have gotten through. Mm-hmm. So. Sometimes you just got to not play by the rules. Under the radar. <laughs> That's the theme. 